Hello, hello! Welcome to another episode of History in the Dark. I am your host, Darkness the Curse. And before we begin, as always, thank you so much to my generous patrons, my British Rail critics, and of course, my underwater train finders. You were the reason why this content remains. What? And today, we are going to discuss locomotives that do exactly that thing. What? These are five locomotives that just confuse everybody who sees them. The German 460 pulverized lignite locomotive. Boy, howdy. That is certainly a tender, isn't it? Usually I wouldn't describe a tender like this, but I gotta admit, that thing is big chunkus. Because it's just so beefy. The Tender is intentionally oversized to store as much coal as possible because this locomotive was designed to use a very, very specific kind of coal. Pulverized lignite. Lignite is often referred to as brown coal. It's soft, brown, combustible, sedimentary rock. It's not considered a very high grade of coal. In fact, it's considered literally the lowest rank of coal due to its low heat content. It's not very useful when it comes to fueling a locomotive. So in order for it to work in this context, you need a lot of it. And a boiler designed to run off of it is gonna be very hungry for more. Hence why the tender had to be huge. It gives it a very interesting, beefy industrial appearance that I have to admit I actually find kind of appealing, I'm not gonna lie. It looks pretty cool. And when it was tested in 1928, believe it or not, it actually worked. Which is interesting, because similar experiments were being conducted in the USA, and those experiments were a failure. But the German attempt seems to have made it function. Though admittedly in this setup, it was never going to be better than regular coal. It's just the nature of lignite. So the idea still never really took off in any significant degree. But they did make it function. The Modified Zoelli Turbine Experiment What in the... Why is any of... Huh? What is even... I have many questions, and I fear I will not be getting many answers in return. This is a Swiss locomotive, and judging by the name, it is in fact a steam turbine. Now, I've mentioned steam turbines many, many, many times on these lists. And the running theme with them is that they just don't work. Like, they work in the sense that the locomotive can move, but they're just inefficient at low speeds. In a railroad setting, that's a major problem because there are many times where... The locomotive has to go slow, and a turbine is going to eat so, so much more fuel than a traditional locomotive ever will at those speeds. At high speeds, they're great, but they can only go feasibly at those speeds for a fairly limited amount of time just due to the way a railroad operates. This experiment was going on in the 1920s, and the picture is from 1924. They were trying to get the locomotive to work better, and all this stuff you see is um, actually additional components that were added to the design. That big thing on the side, for example, is actually a condenser. There's another one on the other side of the boiler as well. And that weird nose cone, well, part of that was meant to be streamlining, which uh, really doesn't mesh well with the rest of it. Therefore, I questioned the point, but it also houses a draft fan. All this was meant to make it work better. It um, really didn't assist the problem at all. The locomotive was eventually scrapped. The BBO 1082. Okay, I'm gonna give you a few guesses as to what this thing even is. You're probably really confused because this looks like a steam locomotive, but it's got pantographs. Is it the Swiss again? Are they doing one of those weird electric steam setups that they did during World War II because they didn't have enough access to coal? Well, no. This in fact has nothing to do with steam at all. It just looks like it at face value. It is a purely electric locomotive that was constructed by Austria. Why does it look like a traditional steam engine, though? Why, why, why that? Well, it was actually for a completely legitimate reason. See, at the time in Austria, single-phase alternating current lines were being operated at the unusual frequency of 16 and 2 thirds hertz. Because at 50 hertz, the commutation which is the power transmission to the rotor windings of a single phase alternating current motor would have been really problematic. However, in comparison, direct current motors were a lot easier to control. 
and three-phase asynchronous motors were easier to maintain. So, because of this weird conundrum, where they wanted to use alternating current because it is generally better, especially for long-distance electricity transmission, but wanted to use a direct current motor, attempts were made to actually convert the electricity in the locomotive itself. Seems like a really weird thing to do, but for them at the time it made sense. In 1931, the Austrian Siemens Schruckert Werk wanted to test the new concept with a phase converter generator, which would have allowed direct current operation with an alternating current power supply. Originally, they were actually going to modify a 1080.1 locomotive for this, but there wasn't enough room. They weren't big enough to house the converter. So they built a brand new locomotive with a rotating phase changer generator. That's why the drum is there. It's not a steam boiler in any way. That is the phase converter for changing the current from AC to DC so the locomotive's DC motors can run off of AC lines. As crazy as it sounds, it actually worked pretty well. The locomotive performed as was advertised, and they probably would have built more of them for the lines if not for one itsy bitsy little problem. A converter system like this is complicated and alien to regular locomotive mechanics. They had no idea what it was, so anytime they had to do maintenance on the thing, they had to consult the manufacturer, literally every single time. That isn't normal. But the BBO admitted that she performed well, they didn't want to take any more orders, just because of this maintenance problem. So she stood as a single example. It's not known what happened to her exactly. When Austria wound up annexed by Germany, and BBO was taken over by the Deutsche Reichsbahn, she was reclassified as E88.3 in 1938. But after that, any trace of her was lost entirely. She literally disappears from the historical record in 1945. It's likely she was either destroyed during World War II or simply scrapped. Which is pretty unfortunate because, frankly, she's so unique. A museum would have loved to have this single example. And it's even more depressing when you consider that this design is actually 50 years ahead of its time. The basic idea of power conversion on the traction vehicle is something that is actually done in some locomotives nowadays, using the help of semiconductor components and three-phase asynchronous motors. These new technologies allow such a set to be easier to build and operate, as well as maintain, but the very idea was started here. It's just a shame that the single example disappeared entirely, and is now often gawked at due to her perplexing appearance, rather than appreciated for what she was attempting to do. The Soviet Russian Steam Diesel 282 Opposed Piston Freight Locomotive, number 8000. What is going on, Russia? Russia, what is what is the deal? Soviets, why? Why would you ever? I don't know. Based on the name alone, you probably already figured out this is this diesel steam locomotive. The idea is similar to the Kitson Still locomotive that I talked about before that was built in 1928. This was built in 1939 at the Voroshilovgrad Works. The text on the front reads Stalinets, which means follower of Stalin. Oh, oh good. That's great. Everything about this is wonderful. This locomotive encompassed two experimental technologies, both including the opposed piston idea, which was always something that was really hard to get working, and the idea of a diesel steam hybrid, which has literally never worked. The 8000 was intended to be able to supply 3000 horsepower and run at a maximum speed of 130 kilometers per hour. It remained under steam power up to 20 kilometers per hour. When it hit that speed, the inner volume between the two opposed pistons was to instead become diesel combustion space, while steam continued to drive the outer piston faces in their forward movements. That sounds really complicated and annoying and open to many, many problems. And it was. The cylinders, for one thing, were prone to cracking, and even if this weird diesel steam setup was manageable, it just wasn't that efficient. The whole reason for the idea initially was to make diesels in general more efficient, but by the time something like this was ready to roll, diesels were more efficient. There was just no point in a steam diesel hybrid, like at all. It served no purpose, and there were actually a bunch of fundamental problems with the design too. It wasn't just the weird technology, 
it had a 25-ton axle load, which was way too heavy for Soviet rails. So, much like the AA-20, it destroyed the lines it ran on, so thank you for that. And on top of destroying the rails, it didn't even ride well. It was so shaky and so rocky. The crews hated it. It was tested again in 1946, and after that, it was put into storage in 1948. It never ran again, and it was probably scrapped. The FSE.552 What in the world is going on here? Why is... I... What? Is it so controversial for me to suggest that perhaps the traditional layout of put the cylinders in the front and let it drive the wheels normally, too much to ask. I just feel like every time someone tries something different with this, it always winds up way more complicated than the regular way of doing it. So can we just not? Fifteen of these little things were built between 1922 and 1923, and they were constructed by Nicholas Romeo for the Ferrovie dello Stato. That's the Italian state railways, usually simply called FS. They were used on the Northern Italian three-phase network, and they actually remained in service a pretty decent amount of time from 1922 to 1964. And this peculiar cylinder setup, I have seen before. A Hungarian test locomotive used the same thing. And it had to be Hungarian because that's where this was invented. This is a Kando drive, developed by Kalman Kando, whose name I'm hopefully saying correctly. He was a Hungarian engineer and patented the Kando drive, specifically for this purpose. The man had already proven himself developing polyphase alternating current technology, and his interest in brilliant mind led him to develop three-phase current technology for the railroad. And he actually developed a special system just for Italy. That system actually remained in place until 1976. That's all well and good for the electricity, but what's with the drive? Well, the Kando rod drive was introduced by him and first applied to the three-phase electric locomotives, specifically the E.552s. They were the first ones to get it. The reason it's designed the way it is is it's meant to compensate for the spring play between traction motors and wheel sets. The Kando system uses a link frame articulated on the counter shafts of the motors, which were part of the sprung mass. That connection to the drive wheels was made by the so-called Kandod Triangle. The advantage to this is that the linkages, which would only require a lot of lubrication, could be replaced by a combination of swivel joints instead. Sounds pretty good on paper, and the 552s aren't the only ones that ever used it, but the world over, the industry preferred to stick with what they knew. The Kandod Drive just seemed too weird, and didn't offer enough advantages over the traditional drives to make people want to use it, so it never caught on to any significant degree. And unfortunately, in the case of the E552s, they just didn't perform as well as the Italians had hoped in general. Though, to be fair, it has nothing to do with the Kando drive in this case. They were designed with a one-sided driver's cab and a front section in which the drive motors and auxiliary equipment were located. That configuration was advantageous due to the separation of the locomotive cab from the engine room. It reduced the risks of accidents when driving engine room ahead and, as such, the danger to the driver. Not all of them had the Kando Drive, either. Some used the, arguably slightly weirder, Bianchi Drive, too. Because, yes, use everything but what you know is going to work, definitely. Because uh, you just need to experiment with this. That's the, that's the goal here, is to make it as weird as possible. They did function, though, but they didn't function as well as they should have. They were not considered successful in service. Their pulling power was not that good, and they proved difficult to operate. Passenger train locomotives required four continuous speed steps. That wasn't that unusual, but the lowest gear on this thing went up to 16.7 kilometers an hour. That's the low gear? What? Finding them completely unsuitable for regular operation, they were sidelined and given shunting duties. They actually performed all right in that role. Like, they were totally fine for that purpose. And they lasted just over 40 years doing that. So I can't be too hard on them. Sadly, despite their uniqueness, not a single one wound up being preserved. They were all scrapped by the end of 1964. And with that, a special thank you to all my underwater train finders. Thomas Ward, 72267, Orange Glass, Royal Hudson 2860, Lord Hawk 444, Benjamin Owens, Panzer Kitsune 191-232, Mr. Black Rose, Josh Johnson, Metal for Life Guy, Anzac A1, Arthur Roy, DM Trouble Typhoon, Tommy Rossini, Lord Captain Von Thrust III, Joshua Long, Alaric Jaspers, Brian, Jack Carson's Railroad Videos, Major Klutz, Hayden DeGrow, Ohio Trucker 1, and Master of None. 
Till next time, this is Darkness and Abidwala Fawn. Farewell.